Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to this Inside Scientific and DSI webinar titled Turning Innovative Features into Practical Benefits Within the Buxco Nose-Only Rodent Inhalation System. I'm Liam Sanyo from the events team here at scientist.com, and I'll be your host today. We're being joined by UV Shemesh, who's the Senior Product Manager for Inhalation and Respiratory at Data Sciences International. And today he'll be presenting Buxco's Nose-Only Rodent Inhalation System and highlight how it can improve research efficiency and other valuable insights for inhalation respiratory studies. And with that, I'm very pleased to welcome UV Shemesh. UV, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. And the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you, Liam, for the uh, introduction. And thanks everyone uh, for joining either live or on demand. I uh, appreciate it. and. Hope to bring some uh, interesting content in the next uh, hour or so. So let's uh, let's uh, dive in. Uh, today we'll be uh, we'll be discussing the nose only inhalation system and research. Talk about the benefits and challenges really quickly, uh, just as an introductory purpose, and then we'll dive into a mock inhalation exposure study. We'll go through an initial setup optimization. Uh, acquisition and exposure session. We'll look at some post-exposure analysis and alternative exposure methods. So just as a really brief introduction, I'm sure everybody on the call is uh, is within inhalation or looking to get into it. But when we talk about nose-only inhalation, there are certainly many benefits of choosing that route of delivery. Uh, you can expose multiple subjects in a controlled environment. In general, you get a uh, homogeneous aerosol delivery with a relatively low amount of API, especially when you compare the whole body um, whole body exposure route. Rebreathing is typically prevent, uh, prevented, especially if, you, if you're using a flow past uh, system like, like this one and many others. And no dermal exposure, so there's no grooming and so forth, one of the main benefits. Also, scientifically, uh, this has a low amount of side effects and a quick path to the bloodstream. So everything being equal, the inhalation delivery is a good choice. Uh, however, as we all know, there are also some, uh, some challenges uh, when you choose the inhalation route, um, or the nose-only inhalation route, I should say. The animals do have to be restrained. That does add uh, stress to both uh, the subject and the user. Um, chamber conditions uh, are, are a big play. Uh, flows and pressure management. This is a closed loop system, so this really, really matters. Uh, relative humidity levels, whether they tend to be too high or too low. Uh, many types of aerosol properties and the routes through the tower system, uh, loss and uh, other other uh, considerations, formulations, and how they interact with the materials and so forth. It is considered to be a little bit more labor extensive and uh, requires a certain level of expertise. So really the point of, of this uh, webinar is to uh, see how technology and how new features are able to take some of these challenges and mitigate them uh, make them a little bit easier for the user we're all here in the inhalation community we all want more and more inhalation research to happen and we all want it to be as easy as possible and i i've kind of taken a new approach uh with this uh webinar uh, instead of just going through slides uh i decided to actually run an inhalation study, uh, pretend there's like a day in the lab, and go through the uh, software that's connected to the hardware, create a, uh, a very simple uh, inhalation study that you can see here. We have four subjects, four mice. We have a solution concentration of 15 mg per mil, and a delivered dose target of 10 mg per kg. And we'll just go through the uh, uh, the software and see how it's set up and how it's built and how we can uh, make the most out of it with this system. So let's dive in. First, we'll uh, we'll uh, do a study design and setup, which includes uh, flow and pressure management, uh, leak and regulation diagnostics, subject specific dose targets, which will introduce us to smart study. That will be a big section. 
and we'll talk about uh, nebulizer efficiency rate or neb er so without further ado let's jump into the software when you launch uh, the fine point software you immediately get a very quick uh, 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 USB communication diagnostic basically tells you you are good to go we're sending a few signals and we're saying that the con the devices that are connected through USB are properly communicating uh, so nice and easy uh, just lets you uh, move on so we're we're good to go on that and we are on to the first real page and this is a nice uh, nice page for us to configure the controller options here, uh, instead of having the user decide uh, what the flow rates uh, should be and which sampling device should get what, we simply ask the user to enter their system configurations. So they put in the number of subjects, the flow rate that they want per subject, the tower pressure, and then what devices they actually have on the system. And then the software dictates the, all the flows uh, by itself and then saves it for the next time so you don't have to do it again. So just uh, a very a nice uh, benefit of having the user not have to manage all the flow settings, which tends to be a bit of a, a quirky manner. Okay, so we move along. Once that is set, uh, the next page offers the user uh, an option to run a leak test. And a leak test is important because you, you don't want to run through an inhalation system only to find out afterwards, after the annals that were exposed, that the tube wasn't plugged in all the way or, or something of the sort. So with one click, there's going to be an automatic test that tests the leaks and then also tests that all the pressure uh, regulation works properly. To be more specific, in the uh, in the two green sections, we are going to test the actual tower connections, all the uh, the ports, the sampling ports, the tubing connections, as well as the control system itself. Again, we hate to find out after the animals are exposed that there was an issue that caused some sort of uh, 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 problem with the exposure itself. So we do that first. That takes about about 45 seconds. And we move on to the next page, which uh, gets to uh, the heart of, uh, of what we're trying to do here. Okay, so we mentioned that we have four subjects, and we mentioned that we have a, a delivered dose target. Now, something that's very unique to the system is that you can actually put in that target into the specific ID. So as we can see here, we have uh, four subjects uh, that are prepared and they each have their names and their weight and there's an AIA target and AIA uh, is going to be synonymous with delivered dose and gets us off track for the first time as we need to talk about AIA and what that is. So AIA was introduced uh, uh, in DSI about six years ago and it was has been a very popular uh, uh, feature. Basically uh, you know, we are a uh, originally a, a respiratory company uh, in Boxco, uh, and we do that very well. And it was very natural for us to have respiratory parameters measured during the exposure itself. And as we were measuring every single breath, and we also knew what the concentration was, we were able to calculate how much aerosol the animal breathes in a single breath. And then when we accumulate that, we can actually get the real-time accumulated inhaled aerosol, again, the same as delivered dose, reported in real time, which gives the, the researcher a great insight into, into what's going on. Now, we know, we know that the animals, even if they're the same weight, they're going to breathe differently. Right? They're going to have a different minute volume, different respiratory manners. There's... Uh, many publications on that uh, in the handout section, but that's that's not to be argued with. So now, with different uh, breathing rates and different endpoints, we can actually have different delivered dose per subject, and we can actually report on that and measure on that. But the problem was that even if you have it, the different uh, the different real time delivered dose or AIA measurements the user didn't have an option of what to do with it if the target if the use if the subject achieved its target 
you could pull it out of the tower, but that has its own uh, concessions at that point. That ruins the test article environment, it's labor extensive, and there's atmosphere and lab contamination. So people didn't want to do that, understandably, which led us to an important feature that was recently released, which is called Smart Study. And let me try to explain what that is. So imagine again a four-site inhalation system and you have a, a target for all of them and they're all breathing at, uh, at, 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 at different rates and uh, the first animal achieves its target. Once the first animal achieves its target, it's understandable that all the, the other three have not yet gotten to that target. Again, they're breathing at different rates. Now those are arbitrary numbers obviously, but I believe that they're somewhat reasonable within the margins of error. So once the, the aerosol continues, the second subject achieves its target, but the first one is now over target. You go to the third and fourth, and now you have an ununiform exposure. So what we would really want to do is once the first subject achieves its target, we would want to close off that aerosol only to that subject and then and then replace it with uh, fresh air okay so that's a technology that uh we've been wanting to do for a very long time and now it's it's uh it's finally here and let me give a a couple of uh real a couple of videos to see what is truly happening uh, here we see uh, the video on the left we see the actual port when the the uh, animal restrainer gets attached to and we can see that we're now able to close that jet where the aerosol comes out of. We're able to close it at the port. That technology is very important and allows us uh, to, uh, uh, to actually control the animal's uh, uh, delivered dose. And you can see here on the, on, the, on the middle video, it's a little bit faint, but you can see the aerosol coming out and on the left port, it just stopped. Well, aerosol continues to stream out of the port on, on the one on the right. Uh, and that is really the, the smart study ability that we were talking about. Now the one on the right just stopped and the left keeps going. And again, full control over every port. Okay, so we're back to here. And now that we're able to do that with each animal, we are able to get a uniform delivery uh, the, specific to each subject and that is smart study and that is available now and again just to reiterate the point uh, once a target is reached fresh air begins while exposure continues to the rest all of that is done uh, on a uh, completely automatic setting there's no user intervention that's required at all and it's very very important to note that while all of this is happening the environment in the tower remains consistent and we're able to do that by automatically reducing the flow the system flow and the nebulizer output to the same ratio that the ports close compared to the ones that remain open so the concentration and the humidity levels in the tower will remain the same for the rest of the subjects that are still still being exposed Okay, so we're back. <laughs> we're back. Uh, we're back into the software, and we know that we can specify a uh, a in a, a, a delivered dose or AIA target to the subject. But perhaps more uh, more convenient is to actually specify a mix per kg, because then the animal's weight is being considered, which is even more precise. So here we have our 10 mix per kg as a target. We now put in their weights. We can do the math and then put in the uh, delivered dose with doing the math, but then you have to do that manually. Again, more convenient is just to put the weight into the software and then this, the uh, fine point will calculate that for you. Here's the weight and then we've got uh, the mix per kick. Okay, so we've gotten through, uh, uh, we've gotten through setting up the, uh, the system, checking it for leaks, configuring the flows and pressures, uh, assigning IDs, and assigning their, uh, their, their MIGS per kg target. 
so far so good um, now we just need to set up the the aerosol and this is a uh, this feature of controlling the nebulizer is a feature I debated whether to put in or not because it's a very old feature. It's one of the original features of the system. But I still find that people appreciate that perhaps more than anything else. And the feature, is, in fact, is that we can calibrate the aerogen nebulizer to a specific solution, specific intended solution, and by calibrating it, we know how much we can aerosolize in one minute under 100% duty cycle. Basically, the max we can get out of the nebulizer related to relative to that solution. And by knowing that, we can then specify a certain amount, a precise amount of aerosol to be aerosolized in a minute between the max and zero. And that gives you a very, very reproducible aerosol environment from one day to the next, one technician to the next, one study to the next. Very easy, very simple. And, and, and also, as the nebulizer degrades, which they do tend to do, again, you can calibrate and then continue with the same precise aerosol output. So that really uh uh is is a, a very convenient feature and i just wanted to to share some some nice customer data uh that uh again look at this uh, uh very tight uh distribution of of the aerosol concentrations in the environment over the course of six different uh, groups uh, very low standard deviation uh, very very good stuff um, so let's move on uh we've what have we done so far? We've set up the hardware. We've made sure it works properly. Uh, we've made sure we've assigned IDs. We've assigned them targets. And we've assigned an aerosol output. So we're done with the setup. But now comes the fun and perhaps more challenging part of inhalation. And that is uh, uh, the optimization of the system. And here we'll focus on uh, aerosol characterization, uh, estimated exposure duration, aerosol sampling correction, fixed concentration, and we'll actually run an acquisition and exposure session. So let's dive in. We mentioned that uh, we can specify a uh, ML per minute, an EBR. How much do we want to aerosolize in a minute? A very nice uh, feature in the system. But how do you pick which, uh, which value to put in? What is the implication of picking a certain value? That is one of the bigger challenges in inhalation. And it, it, sometimes people just turn it on full blast and, and whatever happens, happens. Uh, just maximize the dose and so forth without really understanding the implications. And what we tend to do is we try to give you the information upfront. So, with this feature called aerosol characterization, what the software will automatically do is map out a relationship between nebulizer output and aerosol concentration and chamber relative humidity. And it will map that out across various spectrums. So here, just on the right, for example, uh, we have a 0 0.09 uh, ml per minute that is uh, relatable to a condition that will be 24% humidity and around 500 milligrams per meter cubed concentration. So you know that if you pick that value, that's the atmosphere, that's the condition that you will be running at. So it really uh, kind of trying to reduce the inhalation expertise requirement. You can do this on your own. It may take longer. This is uh, done in a fraction of, 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 of the time takes about 12 to 15 minutes to do it properly, uh, which is still a very short time compared to perhaps hours or days of in vitro analysis. And, but more importantly, it just allows you to use the system with knowledge at hand. So you can change things accordingly. Let's, for example, try a new sample. We could just hit a new sample here, and then we can define the spectrum of uh, aerosol outputs that we would like. 
Uh, these are fairly arbitrary here, but nevertheless, we run them and then we get a new, uh, a new curve. And then again, let's just choose uh, again. I let's suppose I want to run at 35% uh, relative humidity, so I will choose uh, the corresponding nebulizer output, which is 0.12 mL per minute, corresponding to 750 uh, milligrams per meter cube concentration. And the nice thing here is that when I choose that that neb ER, Fiber will also tell me how long the estimated exposure time will take again relating back to the uh, exposure target the mix per keg target that we entered earlier without that target that would this would not be possible okay um this is all uh all looks pretty good but i'm sure some of you are wondering now uh how do we really know that this concentration is accurate i mean we know that the photometer is you know you can't really take that to the bank uh so how, how how much value does this really have well that's why the next screen the next option that comes to you in the software is the option to run a gravimetric collection now running a gravimetric collection is certainly nothing new and it's been done since the beginning of time but what's unique here is that we can run the gravimetric collection and then enter its data into the software to correct the concentration and attribute that to the AIA, to the accumulated inhaled aerosol that's integrated with the respiratory parameters. Okay, so uh, how do we do that? Very simple. We just we hit start, we run a collection, you know, obviously I'm we have the, the filter, we're not gonna show all that, but okay, we got a, uh, a material weight, we enter it into the software, the software calculates how much the photometer is reading, and we get a correction factor of 0 0.826. Now, what do we do with that factor? That factor is automatically uh, attributed back to the aerosol concentration, aerosol characterization that we ran earlier. So if you recall before, we were at 750 uh, milligrams per meters cube concentration, but now with the gravimetric correction, it adjusted it to 600. And now that will be used uh, for, uh, for AIA measurements. So we get a more accurate representation uh, of, of the concentration. And if you're going to do chemical analysis, you can actually even take the, uh, the vehicle out so you're really only measuring the uh, the compound alone. Speaking of that, speaking of running compound alone, uh, another very uh, very interesting feature that we recently added is to is the ability to put a fixed concentration that bypasses anything from the photometer. And in this case, you can uh, put in a, a value that perhaps from the gravimetric collection perhaps from a mathematical uh, calculation of concentration versus output versus uh, solution concentration. You can put in a, a, a bacteria count or anything that you uh, think is appropriate to be integrated with their respiratory endpoints. And again, that bypasses what the photometer reads and goes right into the AIA. So both options are available and as a matter of fact, uh, this is uh, this is my preferred choice, and we will uh, use that. So we we went with 600 uh, milligrams per meters cubed. That was what we found out on the filter, and we'll put that into the fixed concentration value. Okay, so we optimized how we are going to run uh, the system. We 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 made it accurate. We made it. Uh, we we created the proper environment, and we are finally uh, ready to run. Uh, Finepoint, uh, with all that data being in place, Finepoint can actually tell you how much uh, how much solution you will need to achieve those targets. So here they tell us to put in around 2 ml. We will do that, and we are now ready to run an acquisition. So hopefully you could see that uh, the optimization uh, process that happens with with inhalation all the time um, is is made easier with uh with some of these tools uh, that are available within the software wizard 
So let's dive in into the actual acquisition. Once you are at that last stage, we are actually ready to run, uh, which we are. So what we see here is the four subjects. We can see them all breathing. They're all through the mini vent, uh, which is split into four. So as you can see, the tidal volume is lower than a typical mouse. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but still, they're kind of breathing at different rates. And we can go ahead and uh, start the aerosolization. And you can see uh, the concentration jumping up as well as the AIA. So now animals are uh, breathing in the aerosol. And we have the smart study uh, window on the bottom. You can see the targets for each one of them at 10 mg per kg. And you can see that they are climbing up. And you can see that they're climbing up at different rates. And they're climbing up at different rates because the subjects are different, are breathing at a different tidal volumes, different minute volumes, which will happen with all subjects. We can modify uh, the mix per kg if we want, uh, as long as the, as long as we did not surpass that target. And we can also uh, manually click the bypass if we wanted to close the jet for any reason. Perhaps we need to adjust an animal in the restrainer and so forth. That can manually be uh, closed uh, as well. What else do we see here? Uh, we do have uh, an expression uh, map, so you can decide what graphs you want to see, what parameters are more important for you in the dashboard, change the color and so forth, so you can very customizable to whatever is, uh, is important to you. Okay, as we move along, uh, we're, we'll pass through and fast forward through this acquisition session, uh, but we can see that the, uh, uh, Mouse number four has already reached its target, okay? And that's uh, uh, indicated by the green, uh, the green light there. And we can see that number two has just achieved it. And let's take a quick look at what has happens when, when a subject achieves its target. Their concentration goes down to zero, only theirs. Only their concentration goes down to zero. The others have the same concentration. But also at the bottom, you can see that the flow, the system flow went down and the nebular, the nebulizer output, also went down in proportion to the rest of the subjects, meaning that we are, that is our way to keep the concentration the same throughout the experiment. Okay, so again, all of that is done automatically uh, while pressure is maintained, environment is maintained and so forth. So very, very uh, uh, hands-off, uh, type of system that, that targets the mix per kg that we put out there. So as we move along into uh, uh, the third and fourth, which should happen uh, uh, momentarily, we'll fast forward a little bit. And now uh, the third one has achieved it, and now we're about to get uh, to the fourth one. Uh, when the fourth one, uh, the last one has achieved their target, that's the end of the session. And as you can see there, the measurement is placed and the experiment uh, concludes. So without user intervention, we've gotten 10 mg per kg to each of those subjects, uh, taking into account their different breathing uh, uh, parameters. Let's save it. And then uh, and a report will be uh, automatically generated and this is an AIA report. And recall that since we put in different weights for the animals, they all have a different delivered dose. So we have one at 0 0.21 uh, milligrams, second one at 0 0.2, third one is 0 0.2, and the last one at 0 0.22. So hopefully you found that uh, useful. And we will move on to some uh, post-exposure uh, analysis. <clears throat> okay, we will talk a little bit about uh, in vivo imaging system correlation to AIA and respiratory endpoints, optimal animal flow range, AIA to PK correlation, and animal reduction uh, potential. Let's dive in. Uh, a nice trend that uh, you know I've seen with customers lately is is actually taking a uh, an image of of the uh, of the animal and of the organs, and then looking back and seeing 
what was their AIA? Can I reproduce the same image by targeting an AIA, by targeting a delivered dose? And even more so, which I find very exciting, is to attribute it to a respiratory endpoint. At this point, in this case, it's a peak inspiratory flow. How does that correlate to an image? This is uh, fairly new, um, not the imaging itself, but the correlation to uh, to AIA and respiratory, but I thought I'd share a nice, a nice uh, application of how it's used. Uh, something that is, uh, the next topic is optimal animal flow rates. And uh, this is a fairly important one. I wasn't sure if to put it into the post analysis because it could really also be done in uh, before in the system setup. But um, I find that more, too many users are using uh, a static animal flow rate as dictated by industry standards or so rat a half liter per minute, you know, a, a mouse 0.3 or less. And then they don't necessarily change it because, and, and understandably so, because if you if you lower the flow rate, for example, there may not be enough fresh air for the animal, and you know we don't we don't know how the animal is doing. But leveraging plethysmography, since we have the respiratory endpoints during exposure, we can actually find that range when the animal is breathing properly by doing a pre and post. Uh, uh, experiment. And I'm happy to see a couple of customers actually doing that, finding that optimal flow rate so they can have some sort of play with that flow. And how does that impact? Why would someone want to change that flow? Well, for example, if we if we look at back to our study and we look at 100 mg per kg target for the subject, we can tell that we need 20 ml to achieve those targets. If we go back to that original screen where we dictated, we configured the controller settings, we configured the flows, we put in 0.3 liters per minute. If we change that to 0.2, we would need 33% less material. Now, why is that? It's actually fairly simple to understand, right? Uh, chamber concentration is defined as milligrams divided by liter. That means the lower the flow, the higher the concentration. Delivered dose is concentration times minute volume times duration. Duration is delivered dose divided by concentration times minute volume. That means the higher the concentration, shorter the duration. Shorter the duration means less API and less animal stress. Another way to, to sum up that data is to look at, at this chart that basically uh, goes to this very, very standard uh, inhalation setup. And, and seeing uh, the three columns are 0 0.5 liters per minute, 0 0.4 liters per minute, and 0 0.3 liters per minute per subject. And if nothing else changes, you can see that there is potentially great savings on, on, uh, on material, right? So why? So I go back to the screen and I say, if you're able to assess that flow range, be able to see if the animal is in distress with less airflow, and when that happens, then you can be feel comfortable to reduce that flow rate if needed. Okay, so that's a very, very, a uh, little bit of an advanced feature of the system, but it's there. At the same token, using that plethysmography data, we can actually uh, assess uh, a, a vehicle and API to tolerability, right? So we can see if the if the subject is distressed by an increased minute volume or other uh, respiratory happenings, and then that can give you a tool to change formulation again uh, if needed. And we're moving on to. Uh, <clears throat> I think probably the most important, uh, uh, I wouldn't even want to say feature, the most important part of the system, and that is the, uh, uh, the correlation between AIA and PK. If you do run a PK uh, analysis uh, post-exposure, you can then uh, correlate that PK to the delivered dose. That, uh, that is a standard uh, term for deposition fraction. 
Once that correlation is established, then a BK, PK can be better targeted. Well, that all of that is nothing new. But since we are measuring the delivered dose for each animal, a correlation can be made for each subject. And consider the customer data below, where actually they did not use smart study. They only used AIA. So they, they collected for a certain amount of time and then picked up uh, AIA, which was actually different for all animals because they all breathe differently. But once they collected PK and you did PK divided by AIA, you can see that the correlation was the same. So now if you had smart study, you can actually target PK. With that in mind, imagine a study that uses 12 animals and four of them reached proper PK, the targeted PK, the targeted amount of, of compound that was, that was uh, meant to be in the lung. Another four were off, but perhaps acceptable, and another four were just way off and discarded. You can do the same thing. We can achieve the same green four animals with start smart study using only four animals, so as we can target that PK. And that falls right in to one of the three R's, the reduction, any strategy that will result in fewer animals being used in research. Okay, so hopefully you can see that this is a, uh, a tool, a technology, an innovation that fits that mold, that hopefully will get grants going, hopefully will get in the right direction, and I believe it's as good as any tool uh, for, that, for that vision and for that, uh, for that uh, strategy. All right, we're moving along and we're off to uh, alternative methods, okay? Uh, so far, I've mostly talked about uh, plethysmography, of, by using plethysmography with inhalation. That was the main topic of the last session. But I want to stress that plethysmography is not required for, for this system or for smart study. And I wanted to point the various uh, things we can do with a duration target. So instead of... Uh, Instead of running smart study with a dose or AIA or mix per kg target, what you do need plethysmography for, you can say, you know what, I don't really need that precise dose. Maybe perhaps you're running a smoke exposure or something that does not require that, that really precise mix per kg. You just want to run different groups. Uh, you can do that. You can choose uh, a duration target and put multiple groups on the same tower. Okay, so typically, let's suppose you had three groups, groups A, B, and C, and you wanted to dose them for one hour, two hours, and three hours. That might be three different runs. And with three different runs, you got to clean in between and then reset up, and that takes time and so forth. Well, now with Smart Study, you can actually do that in a single run and simply have, uh, have each group uh, close the individual ports while continuing to aerosolize the others. And if you consider that it might take one, two, and three hours for the others, this one can only take three hours total. So, uh, pretty nice feature. Uh, sure, it's you can do uh, you can do it in both ways, but uh, time is money, so a nice efficiency there. And I wanted to bring up a very nice application that was recently brought up uh, by uh, by a customer, and this is when. Uh, the customer was trying to do a T0 necropsy, harvesting the, the, the organs, uh, but could only do one animal at a time. So if they all came out at the same time, they'd have a bit of a problem because one would be uh, harvested at T0 and another one would be harvested later. So what we did, we, uh, we set up that they're all under the same duration but start at different times. And when an animal is removed, you don't actually have to open the entire tower, ruin the article concentration, get atmospheric contamination and so forth. The, the jet stops and the animal is removed and you can see that they're staggered, uh, in this case, five minutes apart, uh, but we're able to do the necropsy uh, properly. So very nice, nice feature using the duration target. So with that, uh, it's been uh, it's been a long presentation. Uh, thanks for for paying attention uh, paying attention for that long. 
I'll leave you with, with a few takeaways. Uh, typically, challenging nose-only inhalation setup and study design can be made easier by leveraging innovation, innovative technology, and software features. I, I hope you can see that in the study setup. Uh, Built-in study setups lead to reproducible, low standard deviation chamber environments. Uh, go back to that air, the nebulizer calibration, regulations of the flows and pressure, all of that done for you, click of a button, and you're off and running. Uh, various tools exist to map inhalation conditions over various aerosolization output spectrums. Back to that aerosol characterization, get you that knowledge before so you can pick the proper environment. Correlation between delivered dose and response can be made per subject. Again, taking account their unique respiratory endpoints, how much they're breathing in. They're all different, then let's treat them as such. Uh, technology is available to take a step towards reducing animal count in inhalation research. Uh, we know it's going in that direction, so we might as well jump on board and, uh, and do our best to, to make that happen. Uh, the ability to close a single aerosol jet has several benefits, but including multiple dose groups and improve user safety work environments using that duration target. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you were able to get uh, something out of this. And again, I really do appreciate you taking the time and paying attention. Uh, thanks, and I'll take uh, any questions that, that people have. Excellent. Uh, thanks so much, Yuvi. All right, uh, well, let's kick things off with uh, a great question here. Uh, somebody's written, I have a question about smart technology. How does that actually work? And specifically, where does the fresh air come from? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, so each one of the smart study ports is going to be connected to a, uh, a compressed airline. Uh, the compressor uh, connects to the singular controller, and then from there, maybe you saw in some of the images that I showed, uh, the red tubing, uh, each one of those red tubes uh, signifies a connection to the controller, which is then connected to a, a clean medical air compressed line. Uh, that compressed line has two jobs. Uh, the, the one job is to uh, close the jet, and at the same time as it closes the jet, it goes through a critical orifice within the port, that then uh, uh, supplies that fresh air uh, to the animal at the right flow rate. So it's uh, just as simple as that, uh, uh, not, not much else. The, uh, uh, the, the actual closing of the jet is done uh, by a, a bladder uh, that, is, again, is compressed by the, uh, by the high pressure air. So good question. Excellent, great answer. Um, all right, next one. So thank you for the webinar, very informative. You seem to focus on pharma research a lot. Does the system also support other applications like smoke, gases, and other things like that? Right. Uh, yeah, great, great question. I, I do, uh, I guess I do somewhat apologize for, for focusing on, on pharma, which I, which I did, um, but not, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, didn't mean to leave out the rest of the applications, but it is true that I did focus on pharma. Many of the features that I went through do apply to uh, various other applications that we support. Now, you mentioned uh, smoke. So we do have a, a smoke machine and an e-cig vape uh, apparatus that attaches uh, to the nose-only system, as well as the other systems that we have, whole body exposure, whole body plethysmography, uh, and we do gases, uh, right, and many other applications. However, um, I should mention that not all the features apply to all the applications, which is why I really focused on the pharma side. Uh, so, for example, the regulation of the pressure and the flows uh, are are applicable to all applications. That doesn't really matter. The plethysmography and the finding the proper flow range, that applies to all applications within inhalation. However, the smart study portion of it, you do need the nebulizer, the aerogen nebulizer. And the reason for that is because we need to reduce the output of the nebulizer when a smart study site engages. Again, if you recall that the, the slide where we maintain concentration levels, we maintain the uh, chamber environment as bypasses uh, as smart study sites close, 
we need full control over that output. And since we don't have that perhaps over a smoke generator or a jet nebulizer, then we're unable to apply those features into those specific applications. Uh, so not meaning that, not to say that you can't use the system with it, but again, the smart study portions uh, features are restricted to that, but all the other ones are applicable to all the other applications. So. Excellent, yeah, thanks. Um, all right, how do respiratory endpoints get measured during exposure and what kind of chamber is used and, and doesn't that complicate the usage of the system? Okay, uh, right, big topic there. Um, the um well first let's let's talk about the the uh just the, the bare bones basic the technical aspect of things how do we measure uh respiratory endpoints i will refer you to uh to the handout section to a previous webinar and also to a brochure to look at our uplifismography portion uh, of the system uh but basically we're using uh what we like to recall as a head out uh direct flow measurement plethysmography, which is the most common one, and, and and fairly speaking, the most straightforward one, which is basically using a uh, pressure transducer to uh, measure the, uh, the 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 air, the pressure differential when the animal breathes in and out uh, of the pneumatac. Uh, this is by far the simplest uh, form of uh, respiratory measurement when you compare it to, like, for example, the whole body uh, plethysmography, which is indirect. So the the uh, the measurement themselves are fairly simplistic, as long as uh, there is a sealed chamber. And I think that when you perhaps that second part of that question was, does it add complication to the system? Inherently, it does not. Uh, the calibration of the chamber is a single click calibration, and then you do everything the same. Just add the uh, back end uh to uh, to the restrainer. So in essence, it doesn't really the complication perhaps comes with the data analysis. And I think that that's common whenever you add data points, uh, there is more to analyze and more to look at. Uh, when you have sensors in a car, you have more data points and okay, you have to pay attention to that. And again, we saw the various changes, the various ways that you can actually uh, utilize that data uh, for research benefits. Um, I will just mention that I think the second part of that question was uh, accuracy. Maybe I got that wrong, but if it was, there's a very simple way to see if the chamber is uh, is measuring accurately. The only way it does not measure accurately is if there's a leak there. And if there's a leak there, there's a very simple way to see if there is, and that's if the flow signal is not centered around zero. That means that there's a flow going through the chamber, which offsets the signal. So that's a very easy way to tell if it's accurate. I hope I answered the question properly. Yeah, perfect. Um... We do have a, a an accuracy part here, and, and I think you sort of touched on it. But maybe you could elaborate a bit. How accurate is the ventilation measurement of the system? As it seems to be a pretty integral part of the system. Uh, yes, it is. Um, again, the the uh, uh, it's it's only as integral as far as the dose measurement, and this is something that uh, you've heard me advocate in this webinar, perhaps in other platforms. If you are looking to to get uh, more accurate dosing then we do need to measure the animal's ventilation as it's different from one to another. So yes, uh, the accuracy is important. And the accuracy, again, head out or direct flow plethysmography is the easiest one. And for us, you know, I come from Buxco, 27 years in, in the business, the direct flow is the easiest one because there is, it's a direct relationship between the amount of air that goes in and out of the pneumatac back to the volume. There is no fancy algorithms or anything like that. So the only thing you really need to make sure of is that there are no leaks and the calibration is proper. The calibration is as simple as it gets in our system, is as same as all of our systems, single click and you're good to go. If it's good, you'll get a green button. And if not, they'll let you know. Uh, again, the only possibility for an accurate uh, flow measurements and volume measurements is gonna be a leak. And I guess I mentioned that in the previous question. Uh, how to observe that, uh, but uh, not very common. I would say that the ventilation uh, accuracy is very good. Excellent, great to hear. Um, could you elaborate a bit more on how we can assess the tolerability of new test compounds using plethysmography? 
Uh, right. Uh, yes. So that was on the uh, uh, the post analysis uh, slide. Uh, is again, we were happy to see customers doing that, and I presented some customer data that saw the the uh, the minute volume of the animal increasing over time due to the uh, what uh, the customer believed was irritability uh, to the buffer. Uh, and, and actually, uh, a, a very nice way to do that is to actually take a singular smart study port and just give a, an animal, a control animal, only fresh air while the others are getting uh, the, uh, the API or a specific buffer that you're testing, and then see how, that, how the animal reacts to it from a respiratory endpoint. If it's distressed, you'll see that minute volume tend to go up. As they're trying, as they're having more difficult time uh, breathing and struggling, so that is uh, certainly it's not hard science, but uh, uh, certainly that data point is much better than having nothing. Um, all right, next one here. We've been having issues with pressure management in our inhalation system. Uh, can you speak on how this system achieved a slight negative pressure? Um, our system. Um, it's a, it's, it's a great question, so I take a little time here. Uh, our system handles it a little bit different. As a matter of fact, we've had a change uh, in our own system uh, uh, two years ago, which I think was a, a change, uh, uh, an important change uh, that may have been overlooked. Uh, what we do is uh, we define the inflow, right, the positive air that goes into the system through that configurator that I showed in one of the earlier slides where the user simply defines uh, what they have on their system, number of animals, number of sampling ports, and so forth. And that inflow is set uh, by the system, and it's static. That means that stays the same, which leaves us with the negative flow regulation. And we've been, in two years ago, we put the negative flow on a PID loop to regulate against a pressure target that the customer chooses. So if a user chooses any, any given pressure, the outflow, the negative, the negative flow will adjust itself in order to achieve that pressure. And what that does, the, the reason that it really helps is because there's not a lot of play when you choose a slight negative pressure, which is the most common pressure that, that people choose. Uh, there's not a lot of play since it's a closed system. So the tolerances in the mass flow meters can cause issues sometimes. And I don't know if that's the issue that, that, uh, that uh, you're having there, but the fact that we can move that outflow out uh, in order to compensate for any tolerances uh, really helps us to just regulate that pressure easily where the user doesn't even see that's an issue. So again, the negative flow is on a PID loop. It's a dynamic flow that adjusts itself in order to meet the pressure target instead of previously it was static. Excellent, uh, thanks a lot. Um, all right, do the delivered dose reports and respiratory endpoints provided by Buxio correlate well with the actual lung deposition confirmed through imaging techniques? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. And, and I guess I would say that you know, I'm very. I was very happy to see our customers using that that uh, the imaging technique and relating it to dose and even to the respiratory parameters was a real surprise to me. And and uh, again, very happy to see that. Uh, but this is fairly a fairly new trend, especially uh, when you consider that it's related to dose, a smart study, and so forth, which is a relatively new feature. So I guess I would say that the data is just starting to come in. So I'm not comfortable saying that hey you're i'm guaranteeing you're going to get see a correlation there for sure i will say that the fact that the customers are using it the, and the data is starting to come in that we should get some papers and publications and get the uh get the uh, latest on it in the coming months and uh, i certainly hope for a fantastic correlation and i think that hopefully we can update everybody that that joined this webinar with uh with those uh, publications when they do come out. So hoping for good news, the data is starting to come in. Uh, so I suppose more on that later. Excellent, yeah, I'm to have my fingers, fingers crossed. Um, all right, so uh, what's the, this question here, what's the suitability for long-term studies and especially uh, to ensure the results stay consistent over extended periods? 
Yeah, that's um, that's one of the one of the bigger challenges uh, in inhalation. Um, you know, to sometimes you have long longitudinal studies, and you do have to create uh, the same conditions over and over again. And I think that the the as far as suitability, I'll I'll point to the to our most basic feature that you know maybe I overpassed too quickly during during the session, but. I really believe that the calibration of the nebulizer itself and then the uh, the assignment of the amount of output per minute that the system can achieve uh, will yield reproducible results, consistent results from day to day. Because the nebulizer, any nebulizer, is going to be a degrading piece of equipment. Uh, and the user can be none the wiser. So the fact that you can actually calibrate and see if it degrades and then the software can compensate for that uh, allows to have a consistent output of compound. Uh, add to it the regulation of the flows and pressures, which uh, again, without user intervention, there's no user error. And that again, yields you know a consistent run from one day to the next. And uh, again, we can point to the to uh, uh, our, our slide, which we can go to here to see that the various groups over various days resulted in a very small standard deviation. Uh, so again, I attribute most of that, that, I'd like to say attribute to the nice fancy features of smart study and so forth, aerosol concentration, but I really believe that the, the, uh, the suitability for long-term, uh, the best feature is in fact, uh, the regulation of the nebulizer flows and pressures. Fantastic. Um, all right. Well, I think in the interest of time, we'll just have one last question here. Uh, UV, from a broader perspective, how do you see the future of inhalation studies evolving? <laughs> um, well, I, thank you for asking me that. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm uh, uh, taken aback a little bit, but uh, uh, thanks for the the. the the, I appreciate the, the, the question and, uh, and for my opinion on that. Um, I, I really do believe that the inhalation industry is an old one uh, that has kind of been the same for a while. And, and I believe that there are benefits to be had from newer technology. Now, I, I understand that these things don't happen overnight. Uh, far from it. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it takes years. Uh, but I, I, I believe that in the interest of of the uh, the, the three R's, that uh, and, and moving from either reduction to animals or eliminating animal research, going to cells and so forth, I believe that there is a part for us to play, uh, all of us. Uh, in trying to reduce the amount of animals, at least. I don't think inhalation is ever going away. Uh, I, I, it's, it, we're all in the inhalation community, love to be in the inhalation community, we want to see more and more inhalation studies. But as we want to see more and more inhalation studies, I think we all have to be cognizant of how do we reduce the number of animals. Uh, that's, that's the wave of the future. And uh, that's where uh, grants are. And uh, I hope, uh, and I'll do the best that I can, uh, to, uh, uh, to to make uh, to provide us with with some uh, technology that can uh, uh, lead us to that path. Uh, again, uh, back to I, I go back to the uh, uh, if you can achieve the exact same goal with uh, half the amount of animals, um, then let's do it. So uh, I guess that's that's my piece on where inhalation is going. Uh, hopefully. Uh, uh, again, I, I appreciate anybody take, taking taking that to the bank. Excellent. Yeah, really fantastic answer. Um, so yeah, UV, thanks so much for uh, being with us today and sharing your insights. It's really been a pleasure having you with us. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for, for dialing in. Yeah, definitely. Big thanks to the audience for participating. Um, and last but not least, of course, we'd like to thank uh, the sponsors, DSI and Harper Bioscience. Uh, and in closing, we hope you enjoyed this Inside Scientific webinar, and we'll see you again next time. Have a great day, everyone.